Part 2, Chapter 6 The inspection party set out at 9 a.m., and the four men were back at 3 o'clock, having gone a distance of some six miles. Shackleton called all hands together at 5 o'clock and informed them that we could make progress to the west. He said that they would leave about 36 hours later, very early the morning on December 23rd, and they would travel mostly at night when temperatures would be lower and the ice surface firmer. Furthermore, he said since they would be on the trail over Christmas, they would observe the holiday before leaving and all hands could eat everything they wanted for supper in the next day. A great deal of food would have to be left behind anyway. This last announcement was enough to win overall, but the stanchest holdouts against the plan. The Christmas gorgie began immediately and lasted almost all the next day, with every man eating all he could hold, and everybody finishing up feeling full as a tick, Green Street remarked. The men were called at 3.30 the following morning, and they started an hour later. All hands were put on the sledge supporting the James Caird and succeeded in getting it across the open water surrounding their flow. They pushed her until they reached a high-pressure ridge, then half the party went to work hacking away through it, while the others returned for the, David, uh, the Dudley Docker. The Stancombe Wills was to be left behind. By about 7 a.m., they had relayed the boats more than a mile to the west, and all hands went back to, the, back to camp to eat breakfast. At 9 o'clock, the teams were harnessed and set off toward the boats, pulling off the stores and equipment the sledges could carry. At 1 p.m., the tents were pitched at the new campsite and everybody turned in. It was dismally wet. The tent floorings the men had devised at Ocean Camp had been left behind. Now they had only canvas ground covers or pieces of sail from the Endurance, which offered almost no resistance to the water covering the ice. After a time, Macklin and Worsley gave up trying to sleep in their tent and spread their soaked sleeping bags in the bottom of the Dudley Docker. It was a very uncomfortable surface for sleeping, but at least it was relatively dry. Shackleton summoned Worsley at 7 o'clock that evening. He handed him a corked bottle, a corked pickle bottle containing a note, and instructed Worsley to return to Ocean Camp with Green Street's team and leave it there. It es in essence, the note said that the Endurance had been crushed and abandoned at 69 degrees 5 minutes south, 51 degrees 35 minutes west, and that the members of the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition were then at 67 degrees north, uh, degree, 67 degrees 9 minutes south, 52 degrees 25 minutes west, and proceeding to, west, uh, to the west across the ice in the hope of reaching land. The message concluded, all well. It was dated December 23rd, 1915, and signed Ernest Shackleton. Worsley placed the bottle with its message in the stern of the Stancombe Wills back at Ocean Camp. The note was very simply a message to, po uh, to posterity, explaining to those who might come after what had happened to Shackleton and his men in 1915. Shackleton had purposely refrained from leaving the note until after the party had left Ocean Camp for fear that the men might find it and interpret it as a sign that their leader was not sure they would survive. Worsley returned to camp in time for breakfast and they resumed the journey at 8 p.m., but toward 11 o'clock, after they had made nearly a mile and a half, their way was blocked by a number of large cracks and bits of broken ice. The party pitched the tents at midnight and turned in, most of the men were soaked through from the water in which they lay and from their own sweat, and none of them had a change of clothes except for socks and mittens, so they were forced to crawl into their sleeping bags wearing their soggy garments. Shackleton went out with a three-man party early the following morning, but could find no safe route for the boats. A long, dismal day was spent waiting to see what the ice might do. Just after supper, they saw the ice begin to close, but it was not until 3 a.m., the next morning, that they were able to get in on the trail again. The pitiful little line of, of march straggled across the flows in the pale half-light, with Shackleton in the lead, prospecting for the best route. Behind him were the seven sledges pulled by the dogs, keeping a healthy distance apart to avoid a, flight, uh, a fight between the two teams. Next came a small sledge loaded with the blubber stove and cooking gear. It was pulled by Green and Ordley's, whose faces, from being so close to the stove each day, were black with blubber soot. At the rear of the column, 17 men under Worsley's command dragged the boats. Even at 3 a.m., the coldest time of the day, the surface of the ice was treacherous. A crust had frozen over the rotting, saturated flows, and on top of this, there was a layer of snow. The surface had a deceptively sturdy appearance, and at each step, it would seem capable of supporting a man.
but just as he shifted his entire weight to that foot, he could burst through the crust with a jarring shock into the numbing water underneath. It was usually knee, dr- knee deep, sometimes more. Most of the men wore heavy Burberry Durox boots, ankle high leather boots with gabardine uppers reaching to the knee, designed for marching on hard ice. But as the party struggled over the slushy flows, those boots continually filled with water. In the soaked state, each weighed about seven pounds. It was an exhausting ex- uh, exertion at every step to lift one foot and then the other out of two foot holes full of snowy slush. Of all the party, the worst off were the men pulling the boats. The shock they suffered at every step was greatly increased by their burden. They could only take about 200 to 300 yards of such punishment at a time. So they would abandon that boat and walk slowly back for the second, trying to catch their breath along the way. Frequently, they would find that the sledge runners under the second boat had frozen, seem to have a problem changing pages here, had frozen into the ice. There was nothing to do but slip into the traces and then, with Worsley counting, one, two, three, go. They would make three or four violent, concerted lunges until the runners broke free. At eight o'clock, after five hours on the trail, Shackleton signaled for a halt. They had covered a miserable half mile. After an hour's rest, they struggled on until noon. The tents were pitched and supper was issued. Cold seal steak and tea, nothing more. On the same night, exactly one year before, after a festive dinner on board the Endurance, Greenstreet had written in his diary, Here in, here endeth another Christmas day. I wonder how and under what circumstances our next one will be spent. That night, he failed even to mention what day it was, and Shackleton recorded briefly all that really needed to be said. Curious Christmas, thoughts of home. The men were up at midnight and resumed to the march at 1 a.m., but at 5 o'clock, after four hours of all-out effort, the column stopped before a line of high-pressure ridges and broad leads of water. While the rest of the party waited, Shackleton went out with Wilde to look for a more passable route. The two men returned at 8.30 with news that a half mile beyond the area of pressure ridges was a flow two and a half miles in diameter, from which they had seen more level flows to the north-northwest, but they decided to wait until night before, pressing on. Most of the men turned in about noon and slept fitfully in the wet until they were called at 8 p.m. After breakfast, all hands went out along the route that Shackleton and Wilde had found. They set to work breaking through the pressure ridges and building a sort of causeway, seven to eight feet wide at the summit for the boats. This done, the dog drivers harnessed their teams while Worsley's 17 boat haulers slipped into their traces, and everyone set off behind Shackleton. At 1.30 a.m., they reached the edge of the big flow discovered the day before. The party camped there long enough to have some tea and a lump of bannock, and then started out again about 2 o'clock. Within an hour, they had reached the opposite side of the flow, where they encountered another area of high-pressure ridges. Never had the going been worse, especially for the men pulling the boats. After two hours of struggling, they had covered less than a thousand yards. McNeish suddenly turned on Worsley and refused to go on. Worsley gave him a direct order to resume his position, guiding the rear of the sledge. McNeish refused. He argued that legally he was under no obligation to follow orders since the ship had gone down, and therefore the articles he had signed to serve on board her had been terminated, and he was free to obey or not as he chose. It was the sea lawyer in him coming out. Almost from the start of the journey, the old carpenter had been growingly uh, had been growing increasingly disgruntled, and as the days passed, the strain of the work, coupled with the personal discomfort, had slowly eaten away at what was never an optimistic outlook. For the past two days, he had been complaining openly. Now he simply refused to continue. It was a situation far beyond Worsley's limited abilities as a leader. Had he had been a less excitable individual, he might have been able to cope with McNeish. But Worsley himself was almost at the breaking point. He was tired of the marrow of his bones, and he was disgruntled too. Each day on the march, he inten- each day on the march had intensified his feeling that the journey was useless. So instead of reacting decisively in the face of Magnesia's stubbornness, Worsley impulsively notified Shackleton. This served only to aggravate Magnesia's resentment. Shackleton hurried back from the head of the column and took McNeish aside and told him very strongly what his duty was. 
McNeish's contention that the loss of the endurance absolved him of all obligation to obey orders would have been true under ordinary circumstances. The articles signed by the crew are usually terminated automatically if the ship sinks, and their pay stops at that same time. However, a special clause clause had been inserted in the in the articles signed by those who sailed aboard the endurance to perform any duty on board in the boats or on the shore as directed by the master and owners shackleton they were now by shackleton's definition on shore quite apart from the legality of it mcneish's position was absurd he couldn't continue as a member of the party without doing his share of the work and if he were to strike out on his own even assuming shackleton were permit such a thing he would be dead in a week mcneish's one-man mutiny was simply an unreasoning exhausted protest called up by an aging and aching body that demanded rest even after shackleton after shackleton's talk he remained obstinate after a time, Shackleton walked away to let the carpenter come to his senses by himself. At 6 a.m., when they set out again to find a good campsite, McNeish was in his assigned position at the stern of the boat's sledge, but the incident had worried Shackleton. In case others might feel similarly, Shackleton mustered all hands before they turned in and read aloud the articles they had signed. The men slept until 8 that night, and they, con and they were on the trail an hour later. Though the conditions of the ice seemed to be to get progressively worse, by 5.20 the next morning, after only a one-hour stop for Hoosh at 1 a.m., they had covered a gratifying two and a half miles. But Shackleton was uneasy about the condition of the ice, and after camp had been pitched, he went with Hurley's team to survey what lay ahead. The two men reached a fragment of a berg and climbed it. The view from the top justified Shackleton's fears. He could see two miles ahead, and the ice was truly impassable, crisscrossed by lids, by leads of open water and the jumbled remains of broken pressure ridges. Moreover, it was uh, it was dangerously <laughs> dangerously thin. The two men returned to camp about seven o'clock, and Shackleton reluctantly announced that they could not go any farther. Most of the men received the news with dismay, not that they hadn't expected it, but to hear Shackleton himself himself say that they had been beaten sounded almost unnatural and a little frightening. None of them, however, could possibly have felt their defeat so intensely as Shackleton, to whom he, the thought of quitting was abhorrent. He wrote in his diary that night, with characteristically peculiar punctuation, turned in but could not sleep, thought the whole matter over, and decided to retreat to more secure ice. It is the only safe thing to do. Am anxious for so big a party and two boats in bad conditions, we could do nothing. I do not like retreating, but prudence demands this course. Everyone walking well except the carpenter. I shall never forget him in this time of strain and stress. The retreat began at seven that night. They made their way back about a quarter mile to a fairly solid flow and pitched camp. All hands were called early next morning. Most of the men were sent out to hunt seals, while Shackleton and Hurley prospected for a route to the northeast, and Worsley went with McElroy's team to look for a way to the south. Neither party found a route that was safe. Shackleton had noticed some breaking up, the, breaking up of the ice around them. As soon as he returned to camp, he ordered the recall flag hoisted at once to summon the seal hunting parties. Then, once more... Uh, once more the party retreated, this time about a half mile to a very flat, heavy flow. Even here, they were not safe. A snow-filled crack was discovered in the ice the following morning, so they shifted camp about 150 yards towards the center of the flow in search of fairly stable ice. But there wasn't any to be found. Worsley described the situation, all the flows in the neighborhood appeared to be saturated by the sea to the very surface, so much that on cutting one inch below the surface, of a six or seven feet thick flow, water almost at once flows into the hole. But what disturbed them the most was that they were trapped where they were. Green Street explained that it looks as if we can go no further, and we can't get back to Ocean Camp either, as the flows have disintegrated considerably since we passed over them. The following day was December 31st. McNeish wrote, Hog Many, the Scottish feast, uh, feast of New Year's, and a bitter one too, being adrift on the ice instead of enjoying the pleasures of life like most people. But as the saying is, there must be some fools in this world. James recorded, New Year's Eve, the second in the pack, and in much the same latitude. 
Few people are having a stranger one. Macklin noted, The last day of 1915. Tomorrow 1916 begins. I wonder what it will bring forth for us. This time last year we prophesied that just now we would be well across the continent. Finally, Shackleton wrote, The last day of the old year. May the new one bring us good fortune, a safe deliverance from this anxious time, and all good things to those we love so far away.